Good evening. Welcome back, and thank you for joining me again. This time we're going trick-or-treating with Bree, so I hope you'll stay a while as we go on a little artistic journey together to help us get into the Halloween spirit. Now, Bree isn't one to be easily frightened. She's gotten into a lot of scary situations before, so Halloween seems like a good time for her to relax a bit and go looking for something a little sweeter than her usual dungeon fare. Halloween has always been one of my favorite holidays, not only because I'm always looking for an excuse to eat candy, but because I've always enjoyed a good scary story. I got to thinking about some of my own ghost stories, and about the times and places in my life where I experienced them. And since it's the season to share this kind of story, I thought I'd share a few with you. So be warned, this episode will contain some of my personal recollections of my encounters with the unknown. And if you don't care for that sort of thing, you might want to give it a pass. That being said, I realize there are enough scary things in most people's lives right now. And so, rather than add to that, I wanted to share with you a few stories that still bring a smile to my face all these years later. Now, if anyone should ask me if I actually believe in ghosts, I would say yes, because I've seen one. Bear in mind, this wasn't the typical late-night brush with the supernatural in a shadowy room kind of encounter. Humorously enough, it occurred in the afternoon, in the living room of my house at the time. Now, for the sake of the skeptics in the audience who need an easy explanation for what I'm about to tell you, I will say that this encounter took place at a very stressful time in my life. I had recently been laid off from my job, just before Christmas, and just after the birth of my second child. Moreover, the company from which we rented our house had just told us that our lease would not be renewed, as they wished to demolish the old home to make way for a new block of high-priced condos. They thanked us for being such good tenants and asked us to kindly be out of the place before the bulldozers arrived. And so we began the process of packing all our family's earthly belongings into a shipping pod. And I was feeling a bit sour about the whole turn of events. All of this stress would soon culminate in a complete nervous breakdown a few nights later, leaving me gibbering incoherently on the floor of a hotel shower stall. So you can see, I might not have been in the clearest state of mind at the time. A few nights previous to the encounter, my young daughter had crawled into bed with us explaining that she couldn't sleep because the ghosts in her room were keeping her awake. Now the house that we lived in at the time was rather old. It had been part of the officer's housing for a long since decommissioned military base, precisely the sort of place that one might expect to find a few ghosts kicking around. Even so, in the years that we had lived there, we had never encountered anything spookier than the odd creaking noise in the night, which could readily be explained by the fact that it was a very old house. So we didn't think much of my daughter's ghost report, and she didn't seem overly concerned either, so we let her snuggle in while I went back to lying awake stressing over the upcoming move. And stressing over the upcoming move was exactly what I was doing on the day of the encounter. We'd been loading boxes all morning, and my wife offered to go pick up some drive through food since the kitchen was already packed up. She took the kids with her so I could continue packing without having to worry about them leaving me alone in the house with nothing but the boxes and our cat to keep me company. I had all the doors propped open to facilitate the box moving, and had just gone back inside to grab another one when I turned around to see a stranger walk in through the front door. I was in the middle of pivoting, box in my arms, when a tall, slender man came through the entry hall and turned quickly to head down the hallway. That's really the best description I can give to you, other than that he appeared to be wearing neatly pressed dress pants, because all I could see of him was his outline. He looked like a moving shadow, like looking at your reflection in the glass of a storefront on a sunny day. I could see the wall of the hallway through the shadow of his body. And even as my eyes tried to focus on him, he just disappeared. 
I know I should have been scared to see a tall shadow man come striding boldly into what was still, technically, my living room. But there was nothing really threatening about him, and he was gone again as swiftly as he appeared. If anything, he just looked as if he was in a hurry to get to the bathroom down the hall. He gave no indication that he even noticed me at all. I remember just chuckling to myself that my daughter had been right about the ghosts, and I told my family so when they returned with lunch. Needless to say, we decided to just let everyone sleep in our bedroom for the brief remainder of our stay. And though I usually slept with the bedroom door open, those last couple of nights we kept it closed, and I did my best to ignore those creaking sounds in the hallway. They demolished those houses not long after we left and put up the promised condominiums. I still have fond memories of that old house, and I'm grateful that whatever spirits lingered there chose to let us enjoy it in peace. Perhaps the officer, whomever he was, just wanted a last look around at the place he remembered fondly as well. Oddly enough, it was in that same house that another strange event took place a year or so previously. I remember that I had been lying awake one night, caught up in a bout of insomnia, which was not uncommon for me at that time. My wife and daughter were asleep, presumably the cat as well, and it was just me, lying there in the dark, chasing my thoughts around my brain. I don't recall what I was thinking about, something stupid and pointless, no doubt, but I suddenly felt presence in the room with me. It wasn't a scary thing, just like an added weight to the air, kind of a warm, tingly sensation. Then, for some reason that I still can't explain, I felt as if it was the spirit of my aunt. My aunt had died many years before this, when I was still a kid, but she had been like a second mother to me, and losing her had been one of the most devastating moments in my life. Now, I've lost a lot of love wounds over the years, but it seemed like all of them at one point or another had visited me in a dream subsequently to tell me they were okay and to ease my fears. I'd seen my father, my uncles, my grandmothers, and even my favorite dog who visited me one last time in a dream not long after she passed. But my aunt had seemed conspicuously absent from my dreams in all the years since her death. I had reasoned that it might have been too painful for me to see her again, and that she had wanted to spare me that. But now, as I lay in the dark, it was as if she was standing there beside the bed. I could almost smell her perfume. You have to understand, I didn't really believe that she was standing there, but the experience felt so real that I had to smile. I I didn't say anything out loud, but I remember thinking, I miss you. A sense of peace washed over me then, like a warm hug, and I felt a few happy tears welling up in my eyes. And then she was gone. The air in the room was cool and still again, and the only presence I felt was my wife lying asleep in bed beside me. I remember thinking to myself, well, that was a pleasant little fantasy. Then... Just as I was about to go back to trying to sleep again, my wife rolls over and whispers in a little girl's voice, Good night, Granddaddy. So yeah, insomnia, great stuff. The last story I want to share with you took place when I was just a teenager. One of my uncles had recently purchased an old cabin which he intended to use as a deer hunting camp and he invited us to join them there for a weekend trip. My father loaded us all into the station wagon, which for those of you too young to remember such things, was something like an SUV, but not in any way cool or desirable to be seen driving around in. We headed out for the wilderness and arrived at my uncle's cabin well before sunset. Now my cousin Rick was there, so things weren't as boring as they could have been for me. Rick was the closest in age to me of all my cousins, so we got on fairly well, and he was glad to show me around the place. I said it was a cabin, but it was really more of an old frontier house that had been converted into a meat processing station for hunters in years past. So think Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and you might have a better idea of our weekend accommodations. 
Now, somewhere between our shooting old beer cans and Rick being stung by a scorpion and getting a tobacco poultice from his dad, he told me something interesting about the cabin. You see, his dad had spent several nights alone at the place while he effected repairs on the old building to make it habitable enough to receive visitors. And one night, he had seen a ghostly white figure moving in the hallway of the old house. Now, my family being the spooky lot we are, my uncle's first thought was that he should bring a cassette recorder on his next visit and attempt to capture some sort of EVP. So, the next time he found time to go and work on the cabin, he brought a tape recorder and made an effort to communicate with the spirit of the house. Now, according to my cousin, whilst my uncle had not heard any responses to his questions at the time, when he later played back the tape at maximum volume, he claimed to have heard the voice of a young girl crying out, Mama! Mama! The chill I felt down my spine upon hearing this was further exacerbated by my cousin informing me that he and I would be spending the night in the room from which the apparition was originally seen to appear. He showed me the room where he and I would be bunking down, and I had to admit it didn't really seem all that scary in the daylight, and something of Cousin Rick's bravado about the whole thing made it seem like more of an adventure than anything else, and I didn't want to seem a scaredy cat in front of my older cousin, so I laughed it off. In fact, the only truly noteworthy thing about the small bedroom in the back of the cabin was that someone had drawn a very detailed pencil rendering of the house upon one of the walls. I remember being very impressed by the artistic quality of the drawing, as someone had obviously put a lot of time into representing the old house as it might have appeared in days long ago. So we went about our explorations of the woods surrounding the cabin until the sun started to get low, at which point our dads proposed to introduce us to an old rite of passage. We were going, as they informed us, on a snipe hunt. Now, neither I nor my cousin had any idea of what a snipe might be, but our fathers assured us that they were a type of wild bird which lived in the underbrush, and that night was the best time to hunt them. Our parts in the matter would be quite simple, they told us. All we had to do was to wait in the woods, each of us holding an empty plastic garbage bag, while my father and my uncle would drive the birds toward us. Our job would be to catch as many of the birds as we could when they sprang at us out of the bushes. On one hand, I was a bit scared at the thought of being charged by wild animals of unknown size or disposition, but again, I didn't want to show any timidity in front of my cousin. Also, my father had never really taken me on any sort of adventure before, and I was excited to finally have a chance to do something manly with my dad. So, my cousin and I waited together in the dark forest, clutching our hefty bags in breathless anticipation of the thrilling hunt which would soon unfold before us. And we waited. And waited. I don't know how long we waited in the woods, holding the proverbial bag, until my cousin finally realized that we had been had. It took Rick a bit longer to convince me of the truth. Maybe it was just taking our fathers a really long time to find the snipes, I argued. At last, I had to admit that the whole thing was a prank, and that we began the long walk back to the cabin in the dark. I remember finding our dads sitting on the porch and laughing over their beers at us when they saw us shambling back into camp with our empty trash bags in hand. Rick at least had the wherewithal to shake his head in disgust and laugh it off, but all I could do was slink past with my head down, too furious to say a word to my father. I ate my supper in brooding silence, plotting my revenge. That night, after everyone else had gone to sleep, Rick and I crept out of the back bedroom and searched the empty kitchen for the supplies we would need to enact our plan. One empty milk jug stuck on the end of a broom handle was soon covered with a white sheet. Once Rick had lit it from beneath with a flashlight, we decided that it made for a passable specter. Rick, as I have mentioned, being the braver of the two of us, began crawling down the hall, holding the base of the broom handle in one hand and the flashlight in the other. I hunkered down at the end of the hall to watch as best I could. As Cousin Rick reached the living room where the older folk and younger children were all sleeping on cots, 
he began to utter a pretty bone-chilling impression of the ghostly little girl's voice. Mama! Mama! My cousin repeated over and over again as he wriggled his way between the cots, our garbage can apparition held high. Mama! Mama! He made it as far as my father's cot when my dad reached down and seized Cousin Rick by the leg. You're gonna need your mama boy, my father growled. And with that, our ghostly caper had come to an end. So, not exactly a terrifying tale of spirits trapped between worlds, but I hope that you enjoyed it. And I hope that you all have a wonderful Halloween. And if you happen to find yourself encountering a strange elf offering you candy when you're out and about this season, remember to keep one hand on your wallet. Those elvish rogues can be pretty light-fingered, you know. Thanks for watching. <laughs>